Welcome, welcome, welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminars. So it's a great pleasure today to welcome our speaker, Dorsa Sadig. So Dorsa is visiting from the University of Stanford. She's assistant professor in uh, computer science and electrical engineering. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Mm -hmm. So before joining Stanford, Dorsa was a, got her PhD from UC Berkeley back in 2017. Dorsa is doing very cool work uh, at the intersection between robotics, learning, and control theory. And in particular, she cares about um, algorithm for safe and adaptive human-robot interaction. So we're going to hear about that today. Uh, for her work, she has been recognized with many awards, actually more than what I can cover at this point. Uh, she got the Sloan Fellowship, NSF Career Award, ONR, AFOSR Young Investigator Award, uh, IEEE RAS Early Career Award, as well as many uh, best paper and best paper finalists at uh, RSS, Coral, and so on. Um, so I want to mention, besides being an amazing researcher, Dorsa is also doing a great job when it comes to mentoring and inclusion. Uh, so I've seen, Dorsa, that you've been organizing the Stanford CS Mentorship Program, where uh, you mentor essentially undergraduate students from underrepresented communities, which is great. And you're also a facu faculty mentor for uh, inclusion in AI, as well as the Stanford Robotics Club. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Let's welcome Dorsa. Good. Thank you so much. Thanks for the kind introduction, Luca, and thanks for inviting me. Really excited uh, to be here and talking to you guys. So let me just make sure that my slides are running. Yes. OK. So as Luca said, uh, I'm pretty interested in problems that come into intersection of human-robot interaction and robot learning. I'm pretty interested in thinking about learning representations and what that means for robotics, for human-robot interaction. So today, I want to talk a little bit about some old work and some new work towards the end of the talk. So just bear with me. Uh, sorry if you've seen some of the slides from the earlier part of the talk. So I'm going to start with uh, a problem that we got excited about a couple of years ago. And this is the problem of assistive feeding. Um, this is a very interesting robotics problem, a difficult robotics problem, because you got to pick up food, which is deformable. Uh, and you got to transfer the food to a person's mouth and like transfer it potentially inside of the person's mouth. And that tends to be fairly challenging, both from a robotics perspective, also from an interaction, a human-robot interaction perspective. Um, and here I'm going to show a video of a robot policy, which is like the state of the art for like taking like a model-based approach for transferring the food to a person's mouth. It does visual servoing, so it does have a camera. It looks at the person's face. It tries to detect the mouth, and it tries to go somewhere close, a fixed pose close to the mouth, and try to transfer the food right there. So let's look at this policy. So it kind of like starts off and like finds the fixed pose. <laughs> And yeah, not that, not that great, right? Like if that user, poor user, was uh, yeah, really having a difficult time taking a bite of food here. And in general, like, like uh, yeah, this is, this is a difficult problem to figure out how to do. And, and you might say, well, why not like throw learning at it, right? Like machine learning has promises to solve a lot of problems. Does it solve this? And I would argue that no, like that's actually like a terrible idea to throw learning at this problem. Part of the reason is if I were to run reinforcement learning here, uh, first off, I don't want to hit the person's nose and get a negative reward, right? Like that is not a good idea. I don't have a good simulator for any of this. I don't have a good simulator for the person's mouth or food or any of that, so I can't run things in simulation and do sim to real. Uh, and when it comes to imitation learning, I don't have that much data for this task too, right? Like this requires quite a bit of data for an expert doing this task and try to learn an imitation policy. So that turns out to be kind of challenging too. So, so we decided to not do any of that. And we figured, OK, maybe like, we could just teleoperate the robot. Like, How bad could it be for me to just teleoperate the robot? Forget about autonomy. I don't want intelligent robots. I just want to teleoperate the robot to be able to like, do a task that kind of looked like what I showed earlier. So if you look at teleoperation, it turns out that teleoperation is also not that easy. So, so this is a person just joysticking a robot arm, a high degree freedom robot arm. Um, and what ends up happening is that even in this task of like teleoperating, joysticking a robot arm, it ends up taking quite a bit of time to do various types of complex manipulation tasks. And one thing I want you guys to notice is this person's hand. He keeps pushing the side of the joystick. Does anyone know what he's doing when he's pushing the side? Any thoughts? Closing the gripper? Closing the gripper. No, but good guess. 
changing control modes. So, so when you're controlling like these types of robots, right? Like it does have an end effector, you're doing end effector control. So you're doing you're controlling like angular control, yaw patrol, or linear control XYZ of the robot, right? Like you're doing XYZ or yaw patrol. And and what he's doing here is changing the modes from angular to linear mode. And that is the thing that actually takes time. So if a person is actually interacting with this robot from an HRI perspective, this is not that great of an interaction. So the question is, could we try to even make that better? So, so for the first part of my talk, I want to talk about representations for shared autonomy, for making this, improving this a little bit. This is not a fully autonomous robot. Again, this is like me still like joysticking to some level. And then after that, I want to increase the level of autonomy a little bit and talk about how representations can help us with fully autonomous policies that learn humans' representations or fully autonomous representations that could be just generally useful uh, for, for robotics. All right. So in this particular work, what we decided to do was we decided to create an interface, a more intuitive interface, for a person to be able to teleoperate the robot in a much lower degree freedom space. So the idea was Dylan here, who was my postdoc at the time, he's at Virginia Tech now, what he was doing was he was providing some expert behavior of just generally moving a robot arm in this space. So you collect states and actions. And then the idea is, can I bring down the dimensionality of these states and actions to a much lower degree freedom action space? and use that lower degree freedom action space to control the robot. So instead of controlling X, Y, Z, and yaw patrol, what I would like to do is I'd like to have a joystick that goes up and down and left and right. Like those are the only two degrees of freedom that I would have. And the question is, can I learn such a thing that, that allows me to reproduce the same sort of states and actions? So we have kind of like a traditional conditional variational autoencoder here, where we are basically training an encoder-decoder architecture to, to basically predict predict the, the states and actions. And, and at this point, you might say, well, why do you hope to learn such a thing? Right? Like, why, why do you think you can even learn a low degree freedom action space? And, and the reason, and really like the answer, comes down to the state. Right? Like, if I want to go from anywhere in the state space to anywhere else in the state space, I actually do need like, all those six degrees of freedom. Right? Like, there's a reason they exist. But, but the idea here is that conditioned on the state, conditioned on this particular task that I'm doing, there might exist a low, lower degree freedom action space for me to operate in. For example, if I'm feeding myself, like this is the motion that I'm doing. So this type of motion, there exists a one degree freedom action space here, right? Like I, I can just press like right on the joystick and it goes up and left on the joystick and it goes down. So, so the idea is that condition on what we are doing, we should be able to learn such lower degree freedom action space. I'm skipping some details here, but when we are training this, this autoencoder architecture, there are a number of objectives and loss functions that we would like to have. Specifically, we would like this action space to satisfy the usual control properties that we are interested in. Right? Like, I would like this lower dimensional latent action to satisfy things like reachability, controllability, linearity, temporal consistency. So, so for example, like, what I mean by that is if I'm in a particular state and I press right on the joystick and my arm goes like, a little bit in this direction, when I press right again in similar states, I would expect it to be consistent, right? Like temporally consistent here. Or like for example, linearity, right? Like if I'm pressing right a little bit, or versus when I'm pressing right like quite a bit, I would I would expect like scaling properties to be satisfied on this control, control, low, lower degree freedom control space. So those are properties that we incorporate as part of the loss function here when we are training this autoencoder like architecture. All right, so fairly simple autoencoder architecture. What can happen is that at test time, I can just pull out the decoder. I can bring in a new user. And the new user is going to control using a joystick, two degrees of freedom, and then be able to actually reconstruct some of these actions, condition, condition, and state. Let's see how that works in practice. right? So, so we have end effector control on the left, controlling six things at the same time. And then this idea of latent actions, two degrees of freedom on, uh, on the right here. And as you can see in the videos, it's, it's a lot easier to move around like, between the shelves and perform this long horizon task of making an apple pie, fake apple pie. Uh, but but it, it turns out to be a lot easier and smoother to use like, latent actions as opposed to like, usual like controlling six things at the same time. So, so faster, smoother, people like it. It kind of like, works nicely, and people prefer this. We also specifically worked with two users with disabilities. So these are users who actually use these types of robot arms in their everyday home like activities. So, so they, they, have, uh, they basically have like these power wheelchairs with a robot arm 
on, on the power wheelchair. Uh, and they, they are very familiar with using end effector control. So with these two users with uh, disability, we actually ask them to control the robot for two different tasks, like an entree task and a dessert task. And again, like you can see the rollout of trajectories and how they look like. Again, this idea of latent actions plus a little bit of shared autonomy added on top of it, like some, some level of belief modeling added on top of it, it ends up being a much smoother trajectory. And both, again, in terms of time, in terms of idle time and active time that goes into doing the task, across the two, two tasks, across the two users, the latent actions approach ends up, ends up being faster than the end effector control. Okay? All right, so, so this was something that, in general, like we were interested in looking at, to, to improve this interaction between the human and robot. One way of improving the interaction between the human and robot is this shared autonomy paradigm, where the robot tries to like limit the action, your action space to the space that is only needed but to be controlled by the human, and that allows a more intuitive, easier way of controlling a high degree freedom robot arm, using a joystick, two degree freedom joystick. So the, the, the other question is, is that enough, right? Like, like, could we introduce other modalities? Could we introduce other inputs that the human could provide here to actually improve these latent actions? So specifically, if I have like maybe like a one degree freedom or two, two degree, low degree freedom action space, and I have my robot arm ending up at this particular, at, at this state right here, and I actually want to do two very different types of tasks here, the latent actions alone can be fairly limiting, right? Like you could only do the tasks that you have actually like seen in your training data. But the interesting point here is that language, right? Like, like me providing like a language instruction here could actually provide another dimension, could add another dimension that gives a little bit more flexibility to these latent actions. So ideally what I'd like to do is I'd like to have my low degree freedom action space, but also be able to provide instructions like grab the cereal bowl or move the banana to the fruit basket. And depending on which one of these two language instructions or any language instruction that I'm providing here, I would like to be able to disambiguate between different latent actions that, that, could, be, that could be incorporated in this particular state. So how could we do that? How can we incorporate language to make this more interactive? Well, one way of doing that is basically building on top of the idea that we were just talking about, the latent actions idea. What, what we could do is we could have a language informed latent action where we just pass in the language in addition to the state, right? Like the high level idea is we have the same encoder decoder architecture as before, but now instead of conditioning just on the state, I can condition on the language utterance. I can condition on the language instruction. And then at test time when the user comes in, right? Like the user can provide the utterance to the language instruction or maybe correction that, that I, could, I could basically guide my, my latent actions with. So, so this paradigm, it's called Lila. Language informed latent actions, and you're incorporating language further into this decoder. Just to dig a tiny bit deeper here, so what we are doing here is we're collecting some amount of data. We are in a small data regime, so this is not like infinite data or large amount of data. This is only like 30 minutes of kinesthetic demonstrations. So I collect 30 minutes of kinesthetic demonstrations on the robot. I provide these demonstrations to crowdsourcers, and, and I ask Amazon, folks on Amazon Mechanical Turk, like, could you describe? the behavior that you see in language. So that is how we are collecting the small data set of demonstrations and language, demonstration and language pairs, okay? So then using these training exemplars, we're using a distilled Roberta model with mean pooling to actually capture, like learn, or, or, uh, have an embedding space to operate in where we take the language, like put the banana away or pick up the bowl, and then we could do similarity search in that lower dimensional embedding space. So at test time, if a new user comes in and says grab the cereal bowl, again, I can have an embedding of that grab the cereal bowl, and I could do similarity search in that embedding space. And then using that, right, I could use a film layer to have a scaling factor and an offset within my decoder to be able to incorporate the language. So the way we are conditioning on language is not by passing in the utterance, by actually like fusing language within the decoder using, using this film layer. So that is how the language is incorporated in the decoder when, when the user is providing, providing a new language instruction. So the state test is the state of the manipulator and the world? It's well. the state of manipulator and the world, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. And in this case, actually, we're not doing any first, like, like this is like known state of like the objects and nothing is moving. Uh, you, you could imagine that you could do this with like the visual state too, but here like we are assuming like access to the true state of the 
So uh, let's see how that works in practice. So here we are looking at uh, this policy uh, using uh, uh, latent uh, language informed latent actions uh, that is learned with 10 demonstrations. You can see the joystick input of the user up and down and left and right. This is the joystick input of the, uh, of the user. And then the task is pour out the blue cup into the mug. Uh, and like, as you can see, like only with 10 demonstrations, again, very low data regime, with 10 demonstrations, you could generally like perform this task. Um, and it does like generalize to like other types of like tasks that you could you could provide like in this environment. So it generally like learns the act of pouring and it and like if you change the object or change it to like banana to apple or anything of that form, like you would actually like be able to do, do this type of task with low data regime. And the nice thing about this is it's not putting all the effort on this fully autonomous policy. Like if you look at a lot of robot learning work, it kind of like expects to have like this zero shot, fully autonomous robot policy that will just like work out of the box. And I think that is very difficult to get to work. And I do think one way of going about that is of course like online adaptation, but another way of going about that is like having this shared autonomy paradigm where you put some of the burden on the human. Not everything, but some of the burden on the human. The human is not providing so much data. They're providing a language instruction, maybe a low dimensional like action space, like action like on a joystick. Uh, but, but that level of shared autonomy allows you to do fairly more complex types of tasks here. So the key takeaway here is to, to allow for a robot to be more interactive with humans. And what we are doing here is we are learning this language-informed representations that help us to have this intuitive and kind of like unambiguous shared autonomy combining the input of the human and the input of robot so that we could do fairly like complex manipulation tasks, I'd say, uh, with low data, with low data in a low data regime scenario. Okay? All right. So that's all great, right? But that doesn't really solve my, my feeding problem. I'm not gonna solve my feeding problem anytime soon, guys. Like, I'll, I'll come back to the feeding problem like, much later. Uh, but, but this is like one way of going about things, like, like in a shared autonomy paradigm. But in practice, right, like, like language is one form of data, or using like a joystick input is another form of data. And humans do provide many different sources of data to us that we could actually try to learn from. And, and I have like an overview slide, and I'm going to dig a little bit deeper um, about like each one of these directions like further in the talk. But the idea that I think is interesting to ask is, well, if, if, if I don't want to do shared autonomy, if I actually want to learn some, level, some control for like doing this type of task, how could I go after that? And we might look at like human children, like, like how do we as humans learn how to eat as a child, right? Like a lot of times we rely on expert demonstrators, right? Like we might have a parent or a caregiver who like even kinesthetically shows us how to pick up a piece of food. But a lot of other times, like we tap into like many of these other sources of data, right? Like we don't necessarily always learn just from expert demonstrations. Like we play with our food. The fact that we play with our food gives quite a bit of information about the dynamics of the food, about the state space, about the interactions, object interactions. And, and I'd argue that this is a very interesting source of data that you should try to tap into. We should collect more of this type of data. It's actually fairly cheap to collect this type of data. I don't need to do any environment resets, right? Like I don't need to, I don't need to worry about like how to guide the demonstrator, any of that, right? We could collect quite a bit of unstructured play and that gives us a lot of information about, about, about the world. In addition to that, we also look at suboptimal agents, right? Like we don't always look at oh, an expert and how an expert does a task like exactly well, right? Like sometimes we look at other agents, like other suboptimal humans who are not good at doing the task, and we learn from them, right? Like we learned quite a bit from suboptimal demonstrators. And then another interesting source of data is, is actually comparisons, right? Like what is like a slippery bite of food versus what is like a more like reasonable, like uh, well done, like like bite of food. Right? Like we look at, like com we compare these two behaviors, and we make a note of that, and we learn something, a representation from these types of comparisons. So, so in my lab in general, we are interested in looking at many of these different sources of data. Today, I'm not going to talk about all of these. We have done some work from learning from play. We have looked at uh, object interactions and how object interactions can guide learning from play data in this work called Plato, where we are predicting these latent affordances from play data. So not plans, not like random like sequences of data, but when you are making contact with an object and, and that particular object interaction, that is the thing that is being learned from this play data. In addition to that, we have also looked at learning from suboptimal humans, how we could capture suboptimality in an unsupervised way without having access to reward function. 
And then finally, we have done quite a bit of work around active learning and how we could learn from active preferences. So today what I want to do in the second piece of, uh, part of the talk is talk a little bit about active preferences and a little bit about suboptimal demonstrations. And then I'm not going to be talking about the play, data, play work. So, so let, me, let me talk a little bit about this idea of how we could learn from some of these other sources of data, specifically how we could actively go after the right type of data that is useful for us to learn something meaningful for, for the robot, to capture human preferences, to capture what it is that people are after. So, so in practice, right, like if, if I have a robot that wants to do a task and there's a human who has like a vision of how this task looks like, right, we can call that vision human preferences. And what we could do is we could try to learn those preferences to figure out how it is that the human acts in this environment. Like that could give me a model of the human, like what it is that the human is doing or what it is that the, or that the human uh, is trying to, like, like how the human is acting in this environment. But in addition to that, this type of preferences also like, gives me information about how the robot should act in the environment. I can capture human preferences about how a robot should act in the environment. For example, how an autonomous car should drive, or how I should like, open a drawer, or like, even like, more stylistic things. Right? Like in this example, we are looking at this exoskeleton and try to capture what human preferences are when they are walking using these exoskeletons. Like, like it is about like, how high maybe the exoskeleton should, should go. And also, like in other like non-robotic settings, like negotiations, there's this question of how to how to learn from human preferences. So there are many different domains where we can learn human preferences. Again, this could be about the task, or it could be about the stylistic way of doing things, like in a more HRI way of thinking about the problem. And the, today, like today, what, what I want to do is I want to talk about how we could learn these human preferences by asking these sort of comparison queries, these type of pairwise comparisons. And, and specifically, what I'm referring to as representations here is reward functions. Reward functions, in some sense, are capturing a representation about these preferences that people are after. So um, let, me, let me just give an example. So, so what I mean by that is, let's say I show two different trajectories, one and two, or A and B. And then I'm going to ask a person, well, which one do you prefer? Do you like, one, do you like trajectory one or trajectory two? Okay? And the human's response to this type of question, this type of query, is going to give me some information about the underlying reward function that they are trying to optimize, their value, right? Like if you think about like value alignment, this is really about value alignment, right? Like me trying to figure out what it is that the person is, wants the robot to do. Maybe the person wants to avoid, avoid going through, going through the, the blue region here, okay? And for a second, let's imagine that this reward function is a linear reward function. It's, it's a linear combination of a set of nonlinear features. So it's not a neural net. It's your simplest form of a classifier. It's some linear weights Ws times features. Right? Like, and features could be nonlinear. And your question at this point should be, where do the features come from? The features come from a designer who decides what are meaningful features for this type of task. Right? Like it could be distance to the table, or distance to the op uh, obstacles, or like goal, or things that we usually care about. I know that's hard. I know that's not what we do today. But for a second, let's imagine that is what, what we would want the reward function to be. Okay? So when I ask this question, do you like A or do you like B, what that tells me is that if the person tells me, well, I like this one over this one, that tells me that the reward function over this trajectory is higher than the reward function over this other trajectory. So more specifically, for a second, let's imagine that this W, these weights that we are after, lie in a three-dimensional space. So, so let's say that I only have three features, and w here is a vector of w1, w2, w3. Okay? There's a true w that I'm after, the true reward function that captures human preferences. That true w is somewhere in this space. Or it's some dot in this space. I don't know which one. So I'm going to start with this uniform assumption that it could be anywhere on this unit ball. Then every question, every query that I'm asking from the user, query of this form, like do like like A or B, or do like one or two, that corresponds to a separating hyperplane in this space. That corresponds to a hyperplane of W dot phi, that phi being the difference between features over trajectory one and features over trajectory two. That, that, that W dot, that the phi, the feature differences, is going to correspond to a hyperplane in this space. Okay? Then the answer to that question of do you like trajectory A or B, that tells me which side of the hyperplane is preferred. Do I like the right side of the hyperplane or the left side of the hyperplane? Okay. And, and based on that answer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, if the person tells me, well, I like this side, I like this trajectory better, 
What that tells me is that I can forget about all the samples that are on the wrong side of the hyperplane. I don't really care about them. Well, humans are noisy, so I'm not going to fully believe them when they say they like A over B. So what that means is that I'm just going to resample. I'm just going to reweight my samples. I'm going to just put more weight on samples that are on the right side of the hyperplane, less weight on the samples that are on the wrong side of the hyperplane. And this is the resulting figure after a single binary question that I would ask from a user. So it, not that informative, right? Like a single binary question that I would ask, do you like this behavior or this behavior? Like it only gives me one bit of information, which one is better. And that corresponds to like me reweighing my samples and figure out the true preference is probably somewhere here. That, that is to the extent that I get. Okay. Then what, what is the research question? Well, the interesting research question here is what I should be asking from the human next. Right? Like the active learning, the usual active learning problem that, that is well studied in machine learning is that given that answer that I just got from the person, how do I adaptively and actively figure out what is the next most informative question that I should be asking from this user. And, and you could mean a lot of things by informative, by the way. So, so what does informative or diverse mean here? Like, 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 like you, could, you could look at different types of objectives that capture this notion of informativeness. But in general, when we say high quality data, one notion of high quality data means diversity in this case, and means we got to look for the most informative diverse point, uh, like, like, like scenario that gives me a lot of information to figure out how to do this task. Okay? So as, as I was saying, this is also like an old problem in machine learning. Like if you remember uh, the Netflix recommendations from 2000s, they were doing something very similar, like movie recommendations. It's kind of like a similar thing. That was back in the day in 2000s for Netflix recommendation. RLHF today is kind of like doing it, actually a dumb version of this. Uh, so so it, it's a very similar idea of asking these types of questions and trying to like fix that and capture human preferences. So very similar idea. We're just trying to like bring that to the space of robotics and introduce the challenges that, that kind of gets introduced when you're looking at a trajectory and like how you'd optimize for these types of trajectories. So, so the question ends up being like, uh, th this idea of how do we actively synthesize new scenarios that we, we would generate on the robot and then ask these types of questions from the user. So I have only like one slide on this. This is actually work that Erdem Biek in my lab uh, was leading. Uh, so this was around like, I'm basically summarizing Erdem's thesis in like one slide. Uh, but, but basically the high level idea here is that I would like to find scenarios. I would like to generate two scenarios on this robot. This phi here corresponds to those two scenarios. And I would like to make sure that these two scenarios that I'm generating are informative. And so what I'm maximizing is informativeness. And this informativeness, as I was saying, like, like there are many different ways of measuring that informativeness. You could use determinantal point processes. You could use information gain. You could use a measure of volume. Here, what I'm writing is a measure of volume. So if you remember, I had that unit ball a few slides ago, that, that unit ball. What is the volume of the unit ball? It's one. Basically, what I'm asking is if I ask these types of questions and the person tells me this side of the hyperplane, how much volume will be removed from the hyperplane, from, 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 from the unit ball? That is the question that I'm asking. So, so, so the query that I'm generating, like the, the scenarios that I'm generating is the hyperplane. Let me go back here. And basically, I'm asking how much volume is removed if the person tells me they like A over B or they tell me they like B over A. So, so that expectation of 1 minus f function, that f is that update function of the human that I was using. I was telling you guys the human is noisy. So because they're noisy, I'm using the usual noisily rational model of the human, telling that, well, they're not going to, like, I'm not going to completely remove the wrong side of the hyperplane. But, but basically, I'm taking the minimum of these two scenarios. Person tells me they're like a over b or b over a, right? And, and, and th that minimum volume that would be removed, that is that measure of, of kind of like informativeness that I'm after. And I'm maximizing that. I'm maximizing scenarios that, I'm maximizing, I'm finding scenarios that maximize that. And there's a constraint here. The constraint is capturing things like dynamics, right? Because I'm generating these scenarios. This is not coming from some library that I've collected before. I'm like coming up with new trajectories on the robot. So the constraint is basically making sure that I satisfy things like dynamics, right? Like that is, that is what that captures. Okay? Not happy? Okay. So that was active learning. So let's see how that works on the robot, or like in this case, like it's a very simple 2D simulator uh, with zero queries. Uh, I don't have any preferences. My car is the orange car. Nothing interesting happens. 
after 30 questions, 30 binary questions, I'm learning heading. I'm learning that this car should keep heading. And then after 70 binary questions, I'm learning how to keep heading, but just generally how to do collision avoidance, stay within the lane, generally like drive in this very simple driving simulator. So, so the interesting point here is that with only like 70 binary questions, right? Like I'm able to like figure out what is the objective of like driving in this simulator. So it's very like efficient, like in some sense. Instead of me giving any demonstrations, like I'm able to like figure out how to how to do this task. Okay. All right. So, so that's all great. But if you remember, I mentioned imagine this reward function is linear, right? So, so imagine that like, like if the reward function is a linear combination of these nonlinear features, I could be super feedback efficient. I could do my fancy math. I could like not even that fancy, right? Like I could I could talk about information. I could try to optimize that, and that's all great. But I end up with a linear model that is not very expressive. So we started with this, and we thought we can convince people to write these linear models. And no practitioner is going to leave their neural reward and write a linear reward. We tried. They're, they're not going to do that. So then there is the other end of the spectrum, which is that like normally if you talk to anyone who is using any reward function for their robots, they're going to write a neural net for that reward. It's not going to be a linear combination of features. And then there's this question of, well, how do I do this active learning idea on this neural reward? Could I like, use the same, the same sort, of, sort of ideas? And this neural net, it's highly expressive. That is why people would want to use it. But it turns out that I would need thousands of queries to be able to learn people's preferences. So bringing humans in the learning loop, like truly bringing humans in the learning loop and learning from their feedback, ends up being fairly challenging if you want to learn everything from, from, about their preferences. Like, like that's just not scalable. So, so the question is, how could, we, how could we really combine the best of both worlds? And, and, and it, is, it is difficult. Like I would say like a lot of active learning work is really like on this side of the spectrum. I'm not suggesting we have like solved this in any ways. We're using a very simple idea that I think is worth like exploring, which is, which is that I don't like, like change the problem statement. Changing the problem statement is that I don't want to learn the full human preference using a neural reward. What I would like to do is maybe I would like to start with some sort of pre-trained model, and then after that, do my active learning and bring the human in the learning loop only for online adaptation. So, so the key idea that we have, this is a coral paper from this year that Joey was running. And, and what Joey was doing was, let's do some level of pre-training. right? Like, Let's say that this is in simulation using the meta world environment. So let's say that we have like a number of prior tasks, like opening a door, like opening windows, pressing buttons, and so on. And then on these prior tasks, I could collect some amount of data. They could be preference data. They could be demonstrations. But I can train the reward function right? Like for these prior tasks. And that gives me a good initialization that I could get started with. And only during the online adaptation phase where I have a new task or maybe a new human with new preferences, what I would like to do is I would like to actively generate interesting questions from a user and get the human feedback and update this reward function based on that human feedback so that I know how the human wants this like, drawer to be open. Well, maybe there's a single way of opening the drawer in this case. But like, you could also like, capture like, stylistic differences between humans through personalization by just like, doing the online adaptation phase. Okay? So with pre-training and an online adaptation, like with this idea of doing like, few-shot preference learning, what we could do is we could bring down the number of queries significantly. It's still like in the order of like a thousand, like for some of these tasks, but it's like much less than let's say if you were not to do that. So, so I'm comparing this few shot learning approach with Pebble, which was a work from Berkeley where it was not doing few shot learning; they were still learning a neural reward. And what you can see is that fairly quickly for this task of like sweeping into um, after like actually like right here we are we are converging uh, to to the reward function uh, versus like Pebble, which actually requires much more data to to, to converge. And we are looking at a number of these meta world tasks. The same story is true. Like you can see that fairly quickly. And in some settings, with only like 200 like questions, uh, you could you could learn human preferences. And actually, in the settings where it's around like 200 or 500, we have ran user studies with actual humans. So it turns out that you can ask these questions from real humans. You don't need to have an oracle. And from an actual human, we would be able to learn like what these preferences are fairly quickly and actually bring in the human feedback when we are using learning here. All right. Um, I also mentioned this uh, exoskeleton setting. Like the reason I'm bringing back to this I, is 
in general, when you talk about active learning to any machine learning person, they're, they, usually, they usually remember plots that look kind of like this. And these types of plots, right, like you end up having active learning, which is like well, slightly better than, than random sampling is usually the other baseline. And, and it's hard to motivate why one should do active learning, especially in a lot of machine learning types of applications. Like it takes quite a bit of an effort to do active learning because you have to like estimate like uncertainty or information. You have to optimize that versus doing just random samples. And it turns out that random samples are not that bad in a lot of these types of applications. But the thing that I would argue is that in robotics, this is actually one domain that active learning matters. Because the difference between those two plots ends up being a difference between a one hour user study versus a five hour user study, right? Like this is a setting where we actually have a human like trying out this robot. The human is not willing to like spend like five hours with this robot. The, the human maybe is willing to spend like half an hour and give feedback, but not five hours. So, so I would actually argue that the quality of data starts to matter a lot more when we are in the robotics domain. And like in a lot of other machine learning fields, like we are at the luxury of not worrying so much about quality of data, just throw everything at it, do random sampling. But here, like we need to like be careful about what type of data we are after and what it means to like look for high quality data. In this case, it just means diversity. That is the thing I'm optimizing. But in practice, you might be interested in other types of high quality data. OK. so. He talked about this idea of asking informative questions from one particular user and learning how to do a task, okay? And maybe doing reinforcement learning with that reward. So like what we are learning is actually a reward function, then, then we are doing reinforcement learning with it, okay? So, so the idea is, of course, like more general than this in robotics. You could do this in any other human AI interaction setting. Let me just show you an example. Um, we decided to look at this idea in a negotiation domain where we have um, a bunch of items, maybe we have one book, two hats, two balls. And then what I want to do is I want to develop an AI agent, build an AI agent that can, that can play negotiations. So let's say I have Alice and Bob. Bob has some utility. Bob can see his own utility. Alice has some other utility. Alice can see her utility. Bob comes in. And Bob says, well, I'm going to propose to take zero books, two hats, and two balls. Okay, So that is the setting we are in. And the question is, what should Alice do? Right? Like, how do I develop an AI agent to play for Alice? OK, what should I do here? Any thoughts what we should do? If I give you this problem, what would you do? What would? I don't have enough balls, but can we exchange with the books? You what? Like, like the Alice doesn't have enough. Alice does not have enough balls. So, so you're, you're reasoning about it already, right? So, so you look at your utility. You're looking at your utility. You're trying to optimize and figure out what you could do and what you'd respond, respond to that. So you could optimize for your utility. That, that's definitely like one thing. That, that's a game theoretic way of like solving this, right? Any other thoughts? What is the learning friendly way of doing this? What would someone in the Bay Area do if they <laughs> hit this problem? <laughs> Yeah? Try to figure out what Bob's utility is. But try to figure out what? Try to figure out what Bob's utility is. Try to figure out what Bob's utility is. You're, you're taking the MIT approach here, not taking that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's also like a good way of going about it. Um, using our own, using our own. Well, yeah, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> someone might say, let me collect the data set and just imitate the data. Let me just like, we like the data, right? Like I could just collect a large data set on this and try to just match the data. I could do imitation learning, right? The other thing is I could do RL. So I'm going to talk about both of them a little bit. So, so those are kind of like the two ends of the spectrum. I could collect some data set. Uh, this is actually a paper from Facebook, uh, FAIR or Meta or whatever it is now. Uh, it was called Deal or No Deal. They collected a data set on this. Uh, they trained uh, like an AI agent that could play this. Uh, we did the same thing. We collected, we used their data set. We didn't collect the data. We used th their data set, and you can train a supervised learning agent that plays this game. Okay? And the supervised learning agent is going to be as good as your data set. Right? So, so in this case, the data set that they collected is really nice. So for whatever reason, the Alice agent that we develop, like, like, do, run here and through supervised learning just agrees to whatever Bob suggests. It's very agreeable, uh, which is not that great, like, especially like, if you want Alice to like, negotiate like, in your place, right? Like, if you want to have an AI agent to negotiate in your place. So if you take the supervised learning approach, you're going to be as good as the data set. I don't know. Like, how, uh, how, like, it's difficult to collect that data set. In this case, the data set was not that great. 
the other end of the spectrum is to do the reinforcement learning approach or like the game theoretic approach really, right? So which is that I have my utility. I'm going to optimize for that utility. I know what that is. Maybe through optimizing that, maybe I'll figure out what Bob's utility is by probing them. Maybe I could do fancier things and try to like model even as a Palm DP, right? Again, try to like capture what Bob's utility is and then do more, the more optimal thing. But the interesting thing is that if you train this agent that's just optimizing for the utility, the utility optimizing agent, the utility optimizing Alice, ends up being a little aggressive. Um, it keeps like insisting and like badgering and wanting the same thing. And honestly, it's not that surprising because nowhere in this utility I said, hey, be nice, right? Like nowhere in this utility of Alice, I said, well, when you're negotiating, you should act in a way that seems at least like polite or like maybe you should try to be like fair like when you're doing this, right? Like we didn't say that, we didn't specify that. Because like we said, well, we optimize our utility. But, but that ends up being like this agent that's not great. So, so the thing that we care about when, when we are doing like these types of negotiations with real people is, is a bunch of the, our utility, but a bunch of other things in addition to that, like maybe being fair or maybe being polite or maybe trying to like be human-like, whatever that means, right? Like, and, and it's really hard to write down that reward function. Again, we are back at that like alignment problem. Like the, we are back at the problem of reward design. I did not write the right reward function, and I don't know how to write the right reward function here. So I can do active learning. I could do exactly what I showed earlier. Actually, Minet did this. So, so this is the work that Minet led. Uh, it was at ICML in 21. And what Minet did was Minet like, basically looked at this idea of active learning here, and there was a metric for novelty. So you identify these novel scenarios, and then you, you ask an expert, what would you do in a novel scenario? And that is more of a targeted acquisition agent that ends up being better than your supervised learning agent or reinforcement learning agent. And, and that's cool, right? Like you could do the usual active learning thing. It ends up being somewhere in between. It realizes when there is novelty, it asks a person, a single person, what would you do in this scenario, which is probably better than not, not doing that. But the interesting thing is we could do something beyond that. And this is a new idea that we have been exploring. It's a little bit of a crazy idea, but I, I do want to talk about it, which is that instead of asking a single person, what would you do, what I'd rather do is to ask a bunch of people what they would do. And one way of asking a bunch of people what they would do is to ask a large language model what would you do? Uh, and maybe a large language model that has seen a lot of text, maybe that large language model has some representation of what is a polite negotiation, or what is a fair negotiation, or what, it, what, it, what is the thing that, like, like the property that I'm after here. So, so what we are doing here is we're basically treating a large language model as a proxy for the reward function. So, so let, me, let me just show you like, how the setup works. So we're going to start with a prompt, goes to a large language model. The prompt starts with a task description. Alice and Bob are negotiating how to split a set of books, hats, and balls. So I'll start with that. Then I'm going to give an example for the behavior that I'm after. So I'm going to show what Alice would do and Bob does and Alice does. And in this case, you're looking at versatility. So I'm going to ask, is Alice a versatile negotiator? And then I'm going to answer yes, because she suggested different proposals. It is actually important to put that in the prompt. It does like that reasoning. Like, like you got to like provide that reasoning of why it is a versatile negotiator. And then after that, I can have my current policy of my RL agent, let's say. And the current policy of my RL agent, I can roll that out, and it'll do something random. That's not great. Uh, but then at the end of this prompt, I'm going to ask, is Alice a versatile negotiator, this policy that I just had? Okay? So this is how my prompt looks like. I'm going to pass that prompt to a large language model. And I'm going to ask this question from the large language model. And I then cross my fingers and hope that the large language model can answer this question fairly well. In a sense that like, I hope that the large language model, like, given, given that example, given the notion of like, versatility, given the fact that it has seen a lot of negotiations, it could be able to like, give me an answer that tells me if the negotiation were, was versatile or not. Maybe a yes, no answer, maybe a probability, but it will give me some signal that I could use. And I could continue training my RL agent with that signal. So maybe I'll get yes, no probabilities. That would be a regularizer, or that would be kind of like an additional thing that would help me continue training my RL agent. I'm going to train my RL agent with that. And then that gives me a new policy. I'm going to change my prompt, the red part of my prompt. And I'm going to continue calling a large language model. Okay? So again, what I'm doing here is a little crazy. I'm, I'm training an RL agent by calling a large language model within the loop. Okay? Um, and um, also, like if you're familiar with RLHF, uh, 
This is the opposite of RLHF uh, because I'm training the RLHF by calling the large language model versus making the large language model better with reinforcement learning, right? Like I'm kind of like doing the opposite side of, side of the loop. But the interesting thing is that for a negotiation task, a text-based game, like going back to this, this game, it turns out that it, it, actually the large language model does capture a lot of properties that we are interested in, like versatility or being a pushover negotiator or like being competitive or being stubborn. Here we defined these properties, so we actually had access to the true reward of these properties. And it turns out that the large language model actually like captures it fairly well, and the RL agent ends up performing like as well as how the true reward scenario would work. We also looked at another setting where the, like we looked at properties that people defined. So we ran again a user study where we asked people, okay, what do you want like this negotiation to be like? And then they defined it, and, and the language model also was highly correlated with, with their preferences. So at the end of the day, like again, we did this user study where I I have a hidden slide on it that's not here. But basically, like even if it is not well-defined, like reward functions where you have access to true reward, the large language model does have access to kind of like fuzzy, some of these like fuzzy notions of what we are after in a negotiation game. Okay. So, um, so let me just summarize this part because like I do have a, a couple of other slides like on the last part that I, I do want to get to. So the key takeaways here is that. If you remember the first part of the talk, let me actually like first talk about the first part of the talk. The first part of the talk, I didn't care about full autonomy. I cared about shared autonomy. I really wanted to improve the interaction between human and robot using teleoperation, using, but using this idea of latent actions and using language as a way of making the interaction a lot more intuitive. So we can have good shared autonomy systems that could take the human input, the right human input, and still be able to do fairly, fairly complex tasks. In this middle part of the talk, what I'm really talking about is how we could go and directly capture those representations, those preferences from humans. And the way we did that was by active learning, where we were learning, actively learning these reward functions, these reward preferences, by asking informative questions. We could be very mathematically correct when we are doing that by having like well-defined reward functions and optimizing for information gain. Or we could start to talk about pre-training and, and, and just like doing the, the, the online adaptation with a few demonstrations even when we have neural rewards. Or we could even call a large language model and try to capture what those preferences are, assuming that the large language model is able to like give me, give me some reasoning there. And if I were to be like if I if I want to be fair here, right, like this last idea that I was talking about particularly like works well in a negotiation domain. If you have like a robotics domain, which is not a text-based game, it's much harder, right? Like how do you describe that? in language. Should I describe that in language or should I just wait for the next vision language best vision language model to come out? Maybe maybe I should just wait until like GPT-4 comes out and do, do something of this sort. So these are kind of like some dilemmas that I feel like today we have when we are looking at these large models and how to use them within the loop. And this is just an example of using it, but like it particularly works well with this negotiation environment because it has like a lot of context for negotiation and it's not like it's not like a robotics task, let's say. Oh, um, yeah, so, okay, so, so, so we talked about this idea of asking humans and asking large language models to capture human preferences. I want to very briefly talk about closing the loop a little bit on, on this topic, um, which basically kind of like tries to get the robot to also be more transparent about what it needs and why it needs it. So, so I have like a little bit of like uh, a few slides around this. So let, let, let me talk about this last part of this middle section. So uh, let me actually like, tell you the story. So, so, so what we wanted to do here was, uh, let's go back to the robotics domain. We wanted to capture people's preferences. Specifically, we wanted to learn a policy. Um, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to learn this from multiple humans. So what we looked at was Kanishkir uh, was looking at this robo-mimic task of like, picking up a square and placing it like, on, on, the, on this peg. Uh, and he like, went and downloaded the thing. He collected his data. Uh, and with the small amount of data that he collected, he got like 40% success rate. He was like, okay, I'm tired. I'm gonna get Sid to collect some more data on this task. I was like, how bad is it? So Sid came along, Sid provided some data of picking up the, the, the square, placing it on a peg. Um, looks very similar to that to me, right? Like, like very successful, very like he did, he did a good job teleoperating the robot. Uh, and then we added Sid's data. And when we added Sid's data to Kanishk's data, success rate went down to 7%. Uh, and we had no idea what was going on. So, so again, like looked at these, like we're like, okay, what is happening? We're learning a very simple policy. It looks like they're doing the, exactly the same task. Success rate is high. Like again, data is like fairly good. 
why is this happening? Like, is, is it Sid? Is it, is it Kanish? Like, like what, what is really going on here? And if you like dig deeper a little bit in terms of like what is happening here, is if you just look at Kanishk's data, like if you just plot the data points of Kanishk, and as he's giving data, like try to like plot that on the axis of novelty and likelihood, he's giving some data. He's fairly like consistent with how he is providing the data. So in terms of likelihood, it's like fairly likely, like with his own compared to his own data. Maybe sometimes he provides novel data, maybe not. But a lot of his data is like around this part of the plot. Then when SIDs come SIDs come along. If you plot his data on the same plot, he ends up providing data that is low in terms of novelty and likelihood. So what that means is that Sid is providing data in a very similar scenario as Kanish, very similar scenario. So novelty is like low, but he's doing it differently in terms of likely, it's likelihood. It feels like his data is not coming from the same distribution that Kanish's data is coming from. And again, visually, it's really hard to see it. But like the difference between Kanish's and Sid's data is when they turn the gripper. Like that is the only difference. When they turn that gripper to, to like go and like pick up, some of them pick, uh, turn the gripper earlier, some of them turn the gripper like later. Like, like again, visually, like I couldn't, like we were looking at this, we couldn't tell. So, so it turns out that when you're collecting data from multiple people, or even if the same person, like some, sometimes like the data, right, like, like it, it is going to be multimodal, especially if you're looking at human data, it's extremely variable, extremely multimodal. So what is the right way of going about this? So, so if, I, if I give this to a machine learning person, they would say, well, of course, there is multimodality. So the right way of doing this is to capture all possible ways of like, doing this task, all possible ways of like, turning, turning this knob, uh, the, the, the square, and, and capture that. So, so make your model more expressive, collect a lot more data so you have coverage of all possible ways of doing this, and then you'll have your robot. But if I care about just doing this task, and you might argue that's not the thing I should be caring about. But if I care about only like, being able to do this task with a small amount of data, I, I actually like, should filter out Sid's data. I should realize that Sid was terrible at this task. And I should like, filter out that data. And, and I, that's a like, silly idea. But I, I do think, like, depending on like, what we're after, it might actually be the right way of going about things. So, so there's this notion of, again, like data quality. right? And data quality, in this case, it's about compatibility. Is SIDS data compatible with the large data set that I've already collected? If SIDS data is not compatible, maybe I would just say, like, forget about it. I don't want SIDS data. Like, like that's, a, that's the simplest thing I could do. So here we are looking at, let's say, this square knot task from RoboMimic. Uh, we have a base operator. Base operator is at 38% success, uh, success rate. Operator 1, it's actually like from the same data set. Uh, if you have operator 1 um, and, and just use it naively, like it actually increased performance to 54% because you added more data. Operator 1 is actually like one of the experts in this task. But then if you do this filtering scheme, of figuring out what is, what is uh, low novelty, low likelihood, and just filter that out, that increases, that increases success rate. Not just on this task, across a bunch of tasks, you see performance goes up if you just use a very simple filtering scheme. You could do the same thing with all the operators. If, you're, if you have played around with this environment, you notice that operator 4 is actually like not an expert in this task. So when you add operator 4 data, performance goes down. But then if you do the filtering, it doesn't, it doesn't really change. Right? Like, like that, is, that, is, that is an interesting point that actually like allows us to talk about data quality when we are collecting data from, let's say, teleoperators and how we should treat that data. The more interesting thing is if I am actually able to get SID's data to be more in distribution. Right? Like what if I could like get SID to not give me this data and actually like bring SID's data in distribution? So, so that goes back to the robot being transparent about what it needs and what data it actually helps, uh, what data would help it. So, so here we created a very simple interface where it turns green if you're in distribution, and it turns red when you're out of distribution. And it turns out that a very simple interface that just uh, like you just see the, the, the colors when you're providing the data. I'm, I'm calling this like informed data collection. This informed data collection increases performance across all of these different tasks. Specifically, let me just show you like this last task. This is the task of I don't know, like picking up an egg and, and placing it. And if you're doing naive data collection, it's 30% successful. If you do this informed data collection of like showing the user what is in distribution and what is out of distribution, you could actually raise it up to like 85% success, which I think is actually like a very simple idea that is very effective if our goal is to just do the task right. But yeah, I think like the moral of the story is that when we are doing this data collection, it is not an open loop thing. It's actually a closed loop thing. And, and we, 
we could like treat this again more as a human robot interaction problem where the robot is trying to be transparent about what type of data it needs and how, what type of data helps its learning and i think we should we should put that into a story when we are trying to do large data collection all right so i'm going to spend like 2 minutes uh, on this last piece um, and the last piece is really about learning representations more generally for robotics and, and what that means. And coming from Stanford, I feel like I gotta talk about foundation models. Uh, so there was a foundation models paper. Let's define what foundation models are so we're all on the same page. Uh, so basically the idea is I have large amount of data. I'm pre-training some objective. I'm training pre-training large models on some objective, maybe predicting the next word, so that I have a representation that could be useful for many different downstream tasks. Okay? So what would that mean for robotics? For robotics, there's a, could be, potentially could be a similar paradigm. I have many different data sources. I have simulation data. I have human videos. I have robotic interaction data, natural language. The question is, first off, where do I get this data? And second, what is the pre-training objective that I'm after so that I could learn a representation that could be used, again, for many different downstream tasks? So what is the state of the art here? The state of the art are kind of like two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is using things like mask autoencoding. So if you look at the mask visual pre-training paper, like that is an example of this, where you have your input, you have your visual input, you mask it, and then you just predict, right? You just try to like predict the patches. It is great because it captures spatial features. It gets all those local spatial features. In some sense, it's capturing the syntax of the task that you're after. But the problem with it is it loses all semantics. If I'm looking at a jar of like orange juice versus a jar of milk, it treats them differently because the colors are different, the pixels are different. But picking up a jar of milk versus picking up a jar of orange juice, like I should treat them the same, right? Like, like they have the same sort, sort of affordances and this would not really handle that. There's the other end of the spectrum where we are looking at things like clip, right? Like things like where we have contrastive objectives that try to like match images and text, right? Like they try to capture semantics and, and, and that's nice, right? Like now I know like this is a picture of a dog or like a dog holding a ball or whatever, whatever it is. But the thing that it does is that this contrastive objective, it destroys local features, right? Like it doesn't actually like allow you to get capture like these local features that you're after. So what we are doing in this work is we're trying to get the best of both worlds using language. So, so the key idea here is we are trying to do grounded reconstruction. We start with a backbone, a mask, mask autoencoding backbone, but then we are trying to use language as a way of keeping, keeping semantics. In addition to that, you might say that that's not enough, right? Like syntax and semantics is not the only thing we care about. Like we care about dynamics, we care about actions. And if you think about the actions that goes on in, in the task, you could kind of think of that as an analog of pragmatics in, in language, right? Like it's kind of like the pragmatics of the task, the context of the task. And the way to capture that here is by passing in multiple frames. So that is how we are trying to capture this notion of change in the environment. So this kind of like brings this, this model that we're calling Voltron. This is language-driven representation learning. Uh, it's a joint work with a number of people. Sid Karamchedi is the main uh, author of this work. Uh, but the key idea is, let me, let me just go to this slide is to start with this mask autoencoding backbone, pass in multiple frames, have language captioning, and language generation as part of the loss. So this is what we are pre-training on. So that way we kind of like get all the details, we get the semantics, we get the context, and we also get a little bit of like dynamics and like what happens when you take actions in this environment. Uh, we have pre-trained this on something something. It's still going on Ego 4D. So we are still like pre-training this model on Ego 4D. But even just on something something, we are seeing like promising results using comparing Voltron with existing models out there like R3M or uh, MVP. And the other interesting thing is that we have actually demonstrated this on a number of downstream tasks. So not just control. Like you could look at grasp affordance segmentation. You could look at instruction following. You could look at intent inference. So on a number of downstream tasks, we can see that the Voltron model, all the orange ones are, are the Voltron model. They are fine tuned on five demonstrations, 10 demonstrations, or 25 demonstrations. They end up performing fairly well, fairly well meaning 40% success rate because there's only so much you can get from visual representations uh, compared to things like CLIP or R3M or MVP. So, so that, is, that is where some of the evaluations come in. You could do this again like on a robot. So this is a language condition imitation learning task. Similar story here. Um, one interesting point that I, I just want to show, maybe let, let me go to this one, is that you could do intent inference even on like things that you haven't seen before. So here I have a video of a robot like opening, opening a faucet. This is from a different paper. 
like this was trained on something, something it has not seen any robot ever. Uh, but the model is able to actually like predict do intent inference in terms of when the faucet is being opened. Like, like it's actually like able to pick up, pick up the intent of the robot or the human when we are using the Voltron model. Um, it's open source, pip install Voltron Robotics. Try it, give us feedback. Uh, we're trying to improve on it. Uh, so feel free to use that. Um, so yeah, so the key takeaway, uh, sorry, the key takeaway here uh, is this idea of using language and multi-frame conditioning to capture syntax, semantics, and then pragmatics to be able to learn visual representations that are actually useful for downstream robotics tasks. Um, I didn't talk about feeding. That's something that we are actively working on, so I'm just going to show some videos of this. Um, we're not using any of the models that I talked about. But it would be interesting to look at how we could use some of these representations that we are learning for tasks like picking up food, uh, like picking up spaghetti, uh, and uh, transferring that um, to a plate. Like how to figure out, like even like doing planning in this case, like, like doing grouping the spaghetti and picking it up and twirling it, and what are the right forces to put in. And then finally, we are looking at transfer. Uh, this is also doing in-mouth transfer, not out-of-mouth transfer. So. Uh, I'd argue this is better than the very first video that I showed you guys. Some might argue it's going in a little too much. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, I think it's, it, this is, again, an interesting problem to look at. But uh, happy to chat about these like in different talk or offline in general. And with that, I'm going to thank the group. And thank you guys for sticking with me. So much. Um, we might have time for maybe a couple of questions. Maybe one question. Let's see if there are some. While they are thinking about questions, so you said that for the feeding, you're using a completely different model. Is that model based? Or is it's very uh, model based. The feeding case is very uh -huh. model based. So we're looking at haptic and visual information. And the only parameters that you're learning are like the angle of the fork or like kind of like just a small range of like what is the force that you're putting in. Okay. Uh, it uses like visual and haptic information to figure out how to like pierce the food and how to like enter the mouth. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I'm wondering how efficient is the training of the RL is uh, if you have a large language model inference in it. Uh, so how efficient training the what, for the last part are you talking about or for? I, I think for the second. Oh, last for, the, part. oh for the for, for the second part, so the negotiation part. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Again, this that was a fairly simple like type of task. So so it's like like you could even like take a tabular approach and like uh, look at um, it's fairly fast uh, like 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 that part, that particular work. Because we also had to call like GPT-3 like within the training loop, but we took a task that was fairly simple. We have a follow-up work where you're looking at playing a game of Hanabi, and there like the task is much more difficult, and training the RL agent ends up like being a much more difficult task. Uh, we're using like open source like uh, GPT models there, so so we're not using like we're using GPT-J for example to be able to be able to like actually call GPT within the loop. If if you were going after like if if your question is about how we're calling a large language model within a yeah. not efficient RL loop. Yeah, is it <laughs> uh, is it like a bottleneck the training time? Uh, or which, which part is the bottleneck? Is it the inference the large language model or? Uh, it's the a, training of the RL that's the bottleneck. Training yeah, of RL. yeah, like it depends on how difficult of a task you pick. But like yeah, like here we should, I showed something very simple. If it is more difficult, it's the training of RL. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so you mentioned that for like training the foundation model for robotics, you can only get so far, as you said, like the performance, it's pretty good, but like there does seem to be some sort of like cap that might not be as high as we want it to be. Yeah. What do you see as like the next advance to get beyond that? Is it like yeah. a data thing, changing the architecture, yeah. changing like how the data is collected, what? I think that's a very good question. Yeah. So uh, all of them, uh, but I don't expect like even so. So I th first off, like this is data of human videos, right? Like on YouTube or human videos on internet. I don't expect to be able to learn like how to do complex manipulation with just human videos. So we do need like more like like we, we actually need like object interaction data to be able to like do a lot of like these types of tasks down the line. So so I think it is a data thing. We do need actions like in our data. So if you collect like if you do a large scale like robot data collection, I do think it does address some of the problems. The pre-training objective is another thing that like we have control over. In this case we did captioning, generation, uh, like mask autoencoding object 
perspective, those are good choices, but there might be other choices that try to capture maybe the dynamics a little bit more or like the, um, the model like a little bit more. So I think that one can play around the, those two. But even then, like I don't expect like a zero shot robot that learning from that being able to like do every single task. So I do think on like online adaptation and fine tuning is a big piece of this. So at the end of the day, you want to collect in-domain data with small amount of data train these models. This is just a good like anywhere you're calling ResNet right now, you can call like Voltron. Like like this is like kind of like plays like a visual representation that's a little bit more powerful. But that is the extent of it. Okay, got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, like. The sort of disparity from going from like human egocentric data to like the specific embodiment of the robot and maybe like some sort of fine tuning step or something or like as you mentioned like um, the robot playing around in order to learn about like its own dynamics, how it can interact with the world, that yeah. would seem like a logical next step. Yeah. Okay, cool. Who else has a question? Thank you. So I'm curious about the part where you're getting feedback on the human user's preferences. Uh, I'm curious about, like in the first part of the talk, you talked about conditioning on language mm -hmm. from the humans. Is there a way to have a similar sort of language-based feedback instead of just preferred yeah. or not preferred? Could you say like, oh, yeah. you should just stay in the lane? Yeah, that's, yeah. A preference. that's a good question. Um, there's a little bit of work around this actually from Anka Dragon's lab, um, where they were looking at like these more uh, like yeah natural type of natural language type of type of feedback. If you have a reward function that is featureized and those features are meaningful and transparent, then yeah, you could like take in like that type of like input and use that type of input to even like figure out like which feature is being affected or which part of the reward function is being affected. When you have a neural reward, I feel like it becomes like a little bit harder to like capture like that type of language uh, feedback. But that would be like an interesting direction in general to explore. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that does that. To the, like what we have looked at beyond like these pairwise comparisons are rankings or scaled feedback, like on a scale, like if you have like a slider, like where do you, where do you drop it? Uh, but we haven't really looked at something more expressive. Yeah. I see. Thank you. So we're way past. So oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs>